Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for April 2021. And I just want to wish a happy birthday to Fraser Rollins, who's turning 16. He's a fan of the channel and a budding astrophotographer himself, who's about to start a photography course in college in September. So wishing him all the best for that. And as always, good luck and clear skies. But coming up this month, we have a new star in the constellation Cassiopeia. There is a Nova in Cassiopeia. We of course have plenty of Milky Way core action to look forward to. There's a lunar occultation of Mars where the moon is going to block the red planet from view. And we also have the Lurid Meteor Shower and the Etid Aquarid Meteor Shower to look forward to as well. But before we deep dive into all of that and more, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. There are thousands of inspiring classes covering a huge range of topics such as graphic design, photography, freelancing and more. I'm sure many of you watching this video will appreciate Ian Norman's class on Nightscapes, an introduction to all things landscape astrophotography. Or how about James Manning's Astronomy for Starscapes, which will help you make sense of the night sky and plan your astrophotographs with newfound knowledge. I've been using Skillshare for over two years now and making use of their courses on freelancing, running a business, but also Photoshop, logo design and animation classes that help me create the introduction clip to this series. So if you want to try Skillshare Premium for yourself and get access to all of those courses, the first 1000 people to click the link in the video description will get a completely free trial of Skillshare Premium for a limited time. Starting in the Northern Hemisphere, where you really want to be making the most of the dark nights while you can, and facing north towards the circumpolar constellations, you'll see Ursa Major very high in the sky now. And there's also some nice galaxies within the border of the constellation Ursa Major. So you have M81, Bode's Galaxy, and that's right next to M82, the Cigar Galaxy. And then you've also got M101, the very photogenic pinwheel galaxy so if you have a nice long focal length telescope some really nice targets nice and high in the sky zooming back out you'll also see cassiopeia skimming along the northern horizon and there's a faint section of the milky way running from auriga through perseus through cassiopeia through cepheus and then across to the cygnus region as well so a nice section of the milky way parallel to the horizon and Cassiopeia is also where the Nova is, the new star, which I'll talk about in this video later on. Facing west, we have a last glimpse of the winter constellations, Canis Major, Orion, Taurus. They'll be sinking below the horizon shortly after darkness falls. And you'll also notice Mars sinking down to the northwestern horizon, and that sets at about 1am local time. Facing south, and with Virgo coming to culmination close to midnight, it's a good time to photograph Markarian's Chain. Markarian's Chain is a stretch of galaxies that forms part of the Virgo Cluster, and you'll also find M104 close by the aptly named Sombrero Galaxy. Zooming out and facing more southeast, you'll notice the Milky Way core rising into the night sky earlier now, and it makes its way further into the south before the morning twilight. It's also a very good time of year to capture a Milky Way arch panorama facing east where you have the core in the southeast, Cygnus at the apex of the arch in the eastern skies, and then coming down to Cassiopeia and Perseus on the northern horizon. Underneath the Milky Way arch you'll also spot Saturn and Jupiter rising into the east before the sun, Saturn shining at magnitude 0.8 and Jupiter the brighter of the two at minus 2.2. On to the southern hemisphere where the nights are increasing length and facing south towards the circumpolar constellations as darkness falls you'll notice the small and large Magellanic clouds picking their way down lower to the horizon and the likes of the Crux and Carina now come into culmination roughly around midnight. So it could be worth getting out the Star Tracker and getting some nice detail out of the Corina Nebula and the Colsac Nebula right next to the Crux constellation. Facing west and similar to the Northern Hemisphere, it's our last glimpse of the summer constellations, the southern summer constellations, so Auriga, Taurus and Orion beginning to set in the evening skies. 
and you'll also notice Mars sinking down to the northwestern horizon, setting at around local 10.30 p.m. Facing east and as darkness falls, the Norma region of the Milky Way will already be in the southeast. And then as time goes on, the Milky Way core begins to rise above the horizon into the eastern skies, rising a lot earlier than it does for us in the northern hemisphere. You have much more time with the Milky Way core in the southern hemisphere at the moment. And as the Milky Way core continues to climb into the eastern skies, you'll notice Saturn shortly followed by Jupiter rising into the eastern skies before the sun, Saturn shining at magnitude 0.8, and Jupiter, the brighter of the two, at minus 2.2. As for conjunctions and close approaches this month, on the 6th to the 7th, a crescent moon will be passing by Saturn and Jupiter in the morning skies. A week later, on the 15th, the crescent moon will be right next to Pleiades in the evening skies. And a couple of days later, on the 17th, the moon and Mars will be very, very close. For most places on Earth, they'll be separated by just 0.1 degrees. But for certain parts of Asia, you'll be able to enjoy a lunar occultation of Mars, which I'll talk more about shortly. As for the special events this month, there is a Nova in Cassiopeia. Now, Nova is short for Nova Stella, which means new star. So there's a new star in the constellation Cassiopeia, and whilst it may appear to be a new star to us here on Earth, it's just a star that we couldn't see before giving off a bright burst of light. So it's a classical nova, so it's coming from a binary star system where there is a large white dwarf star and a more sun-like star in a pair together. And the, the large white dwarf star siphons material from the smaller star. This causes the surface of the white dwarf to heat up and he heats up enough to cause a thermonuclear reaction and an explosion that's violent enough to be seen across the galaxy. It was discovered by a Japanese astrophotographer called Yuji Nakamura, and he was comparing some of his images from March the 18th to some of his images that he took the day before and realized there was a new light source in the image. And when he discovered the Nova on March the 18th, it was magnitude 9.8, uh, but recently it's brightened to about 7.5. So it's getting close to naked eye visibility, but you still need binoculars to see it. And obviously it will show up in your photographs. But as it's been brightening, it might continue to brighten until it is naked eye visible, which will be pretty exciting because the last time a Nova became naked eye visible was all the way back in 2013. So it's quite a rare event. As it's within the constellation Cassiopeia, this is a very northern hemisphere affair. And to find it, you can basically draw an imaginary line from the two bright stars, Sheda and Kaf in Cassiopeia, continue that line for the same distance, so sort of double that distance, and that's where you'll find the Nova. And it's right next to the Bubble Nebula as well, so that it provides a really nice deep space photographic opportunity. As you can see in this example from Dennis DiCicco and Sean Walker from the MDW Sky Survey. Now it will certainly help to have dark skies because the star is pretty faint, but let's hope that it does brighten and become naked eye visible. And now it's tough to say how long the Nova will still be there for. By the time this video is out, it might even be gone. It might be around for a few months. We quite simply don't know. So fingers crossed it gets brighter and more exciting. Another rare event is happening this month if you live in a very particular area of Asia where on the 17th there is a lunar occultation of Mars. So the moon will temporarily pass in front of the red planet and block it from view for those of you within that region of Asia. But as you can see from the map on screen, those within the red shading will be able to see the disappearance of Mars behind the moon those within the blue shading will be able to see the reappearance of Mars from behind the moon, and those within the darker shading will be able to see both the disappearance and the reappearance. Obviously, the longer the focal length you shoot at, the better, but I'll put some links into the video description down below so you can find out uh, whether or not you can see the lunar occultation from your area. But either way, 
all around the world, Mars and the Moon will be very, very close on the 17th. We then have the Lyrid meteor shower, which reaches its peak on the 22nd to the 23rd of April, and it tends to produce about 18 meteors per hour. But unfortunately, the peak falls just a few days before full moon, so it's not really the most favorable of viewing conditions, but a lot of Lyrids do tend to leave behind persistent trains. So after the meteor has streaked across the sky, there's quite often a glowing green streak in the sky for one or two seconds and that normally shows up in your images as well so it'll certainly be worth getting out there running a time lapse and just hoping for the best now the lyrids have their radiant point in the constellation lyra so it definitely favors the northern hemisphere but those in the southern hemisphere will be looking forward to the etta aquarius meteor shower which becomes active towards the end of the month but it doesn't come to peak until the start of may so I'll talk about that a bit more in next month's video. And that's all I've got for you this month, guys. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject for people to photograph and then upload their images to social media using the hashtag Wittens, and I pick my favorite three of the month to win a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky t-shirt and first place wins a photo view photography guidebook of their choice. Last month's challenge was the zodiacal light, and you guys did me proud this time round. Normally when I set the zodiacal light as the target, don't get many entries, but this time it was really difficult to pick some winners. So in third place was Adnan Photography, with this beautiful seaside scene, and I love the colours in this image and the reflection of the stars and the zodiacal light in the wet sand. And you can even just about make out Pleiades reflecting in the sand as well. And that human element just makes you want to be there to enjoy that wonderful landscape and night sky. In second place was Dimitri with this incredible panorama. Again, I love the colors in this. There are so many colors going on. And I also love the way that the foreground frames the image very nicely and also connects very well with the arch of the Milky Way. And then under the arch, you have, of course, the zodiacal light shining beautifully along with Mars and Pleiades. And in first place was Edda with this really serene scene. And I just love the processing on this image. It's very natural, really nice contrast. The colors are spot on. You can just about make out the Andromeda galaxy to the mid right of the frame. Mars and Pleiades together in the night sky in the upper left hand corner. And just a very nicely composed image. There's some nice breathing space and framing around the main subject, the shipwreck in the foreground there. And I just love the overall simplicity and serenity of this image. So well done to Edda. This month, let's just go with any of the special events this month. So whether it's the Lewis Meteor Shower or the Etta Aquarius Meteor Shower, the Nova in Cassiopeia, or an image of one of the close approaches. So the Moon and Saturn and Jupiter, or perhaps the Moon and Pleiades and Mars. Just anything you can capture that's unique to this month. Anyway, thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Be sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.